Awesome. We got we got Val uh, sporting the Duncan spiked gear. You're in the you're in the tap room. <laughs> That's right. That's right. My virtual, virtual tap, tap room. room. <laughs> That's the virtual <laughs> tap room. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let me give you guys an official Beernet Radio welcome and then we'll kick it off. So Welcome to Beernet Radio, where all of your dreams come true. Uh, today on the show, we have the brass from Mass Bay Brewing Co. Uh, you guys are almost a 40-year-old craft brewer now, maker of brands like Harpoon, and of course, most recently, Duncan Spiked. Um, really diversified in the last few years. You know, purchased uh, Long Trail Brewing Co. last year, also legendary out of Vermont, and their affiliated brands, and dipping your toe into all sorts of forays, RTD spirits like Right Coast. So uh, we not only have co-founder and chief Dan Canary, but also uh, Valerie Toothman, new CMO, and Nathaniel Davis, president, chief growth and ventures officer. So woo, thanks for being here, guys. And I will um, kick it over to Bianca to start our questions. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. What? I've got my liquid gold here that you <laughs> kindly <laughs> sent me last week. Well, let's get into talking about Duncan, because that's a unique play for you, but not totally unprecedented since you had a little collab a few years back. So how did that partnership come about? Well, they're a local Boston company like we are. So we've in, we've run into the, the team at Duncan over the years and done a bunch of charitable work together. And about five years ago, a really great old friend of mine um, was a CMO at Duncan. And started we started talking about, gee, what ways could we work together? And we launched our Duncan Coffee Porter. And we've kept the beers going really over the last five years with the mix packs, <laughs> IPA jelly donut or jelly donut IPA, I should say, and the, and a Dunkin' a, a pumpkin beer every year that we've been doing. So the beer side has been chugging along, and we just started having conversations early this year with them about, gosh, what about expanding beyond beer, and what would be more natural than getting into the hard teas and hard coffee markets because that's where you know Dunkin' lives and those beverages in the non-alc space. So we really work well with their team and it was got quickly to, yes, this makes a lot of sense. The decision I think was made in February and six months later, we had a product in market, which I think is, is from having worked on other partnerships with, especially with larger corporations, that's pretty darn fast. So testament to the great relationship we have and how well we work together. And you're not the only ones getting into the Bel BevAlk game right now. Obviously, Coke and Pepsi have. I think I'm most amused personally by Hard Mountain Dew, although I haven't been able to try it yet. What do you think of all these other CPG companies getting into the BevAlk game? Val or Nathaniel, I'll let you guys take that one. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I think it's fun. I mean, frankly, you've got brand, you've got a level of brand engagement with a, a brand like Duncan, where there is so it's so much woven into the DNA of, of people's lives. Collaborations like this kind of unlock a different occasion and a, and a slightly different mindset. And for them can extend, for example, into the evenings. And for us, it's a way to to borrow some of that lightning in a bottle that is their brand and that engagement and the level of enthusiasm that they get that we and and play on a bigger stage than where we play with our craft beer portfolio. So uh, I think it's I, I think it's fun to take brands into new places. I mean, it's a kind of a rethinking uh, of, of brands and you see it everywhere with the Venn diagram that that is the alcohol industry now of overlaps and spaces and fringes and borders. So I, I embrace it. I say, take your brands into new places. We'll take our expertise in formulation production and our ability to manage the regulated side and let's go do big things together. So I, I think it's super, I think it's super fun. As long as it's done with respect to the brands and with clarity for consumers, so there's not confusion. And I think we did, uh, it's a testament to the collaboration of the team to do it this fast and to do it this well, frankly. Yeah, and I think just the only addition from my side is when you're creating new things and in innovation, a really great strategy is borrow and build. So you want to make sure that you are respecting from an innovation or a renovation perspective, you are borrowing the equity and taking it to a new consumer and or a new occasion, but you're always building back to the core of what that brand brings to the world. So in a perfect world, when you do innovation well, it's this little flywheel 
of mm -hmm. borrowing and pulling the equity into a new space, but then haloing back, hopefully to the core brand and the core product in its core occasions with its core consumers as well, and building that business in a healthy and sustainable way. So I think that's the only addition to what Nathaniel already spoke to. And I would say it's, di it's different than the, the collaboration beers that I enjoyed before I was, before I joined, I only came in to Mass Bay in April. It's different in the sense that it's not a collaboration brew, right? It's not coffee meets craft beer where both companies are very much present. This is really, from a consumer standpoint, led by Duncan uh, mm -hmm. on a stage that busts through the any kind of geographic boundaries, for example, and really feels like it came from Duncan. And that's quite deliberate because frankly, what does the Mass Bay Brewing Company bring to the enjoyment of a, a hard tea or the enjoyment of a hard key, uh, a coffee? Duncan is bringing the flavors, is bringing the brand, is bringing the expectation. We are quietly executing manufacturing, formulation, production, distribution, regulatory stuff on behalf of an amazing brand. And we're doing our best to steward it. So quick interjection there. So are you telling me this is more than just a licensing deal? Like, are you, is this like a JV or like how exactly does that specifically work? Well, it's, it's done through license, right? But it's really, it's more than that in the sense of long-term relationships and a partnership and a real deep respect of the brand that is being worked with. And so there's obviously a high degree of, of collaboration at every point and every moment and lots of lots of listening and is being done together. But technically, this is the brand is being licensed in for us to produce and sell it through the regulated channels. So that's how that works. And going all through Mass Bay wholesalers, right? That is correct. That's correct through Mass Bay wholesalers. And although, I mean, I, I would say the interest is nearly universal and there are territories that we're not currently servicing, right? Or servicing completely. And we are, you know, actively taking lots of calls. It's a big part of the, my time now is actually mapping out where we go, when, with what priority, and then connecting that to the capacity planning, among other things. This is, the interest is huge. I wanted to uh, pick up on something you said earlier, Nathaniel, and that was kind of this helps Duncan kind of carry them into the night with a, a beverage alcohol offering. Do you think that works almost kind of the opposite way for y'all in targeting? I know a lot of larger craft are kind of trying to go for the brunch occasion or day drinking occasions, at least with the spiked coffee. Do you think this is something that can fill that sort of gap? I would I would love to hear your view on where the coffee is going to fit. I'll give you mine. <laughs> I think of hard coffee fitting where iced coffee is going and then taking it a step further, right? So iced coffee is taking coffee into the afternoons in a way that uh, it, it, it didn't. It's bringing refreshment into a category that's a hot wake me up. I think this... There's an overlap in afternoons in terms of use occasions, maybe mornings for some people on certain you know, <laughs> on the weekends. Yeah. On the weekend. beer, no problem. Yeah. Me when I'm flying. <laughs> and 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 the like. But to me, it's transition, it's happy hour, it's a pregame, it's it's one or two in the early evening. That's an extension of when I might have had a pick me up with a with an iced coffee. So that is, and that's quite different than teas that are straight down the middle refreshment. Right. right. And maybe a little bit universal. Probably we're seeing already sort of interest and in the early read being higher volume, like the tea category that we know and have been watching for a long time. So coffees are, are more situational and teas fit in a different kind of refreshment with flavor and fun and dunking all over it. Okay. But it is. We're very curious about that one as well. There's tremendous right. excitement about the coffees. And but how that settles out and what the drinking occasions are as a thing as a tailgating evening, refra you know, pick me up, stay tuned. But the I think answer will be yes, yes. <laughs> so I mean, it's not a deliberate move for us to go earlier in the day. We are going where the Duncan brand allows this to go, but coffee is very different than tea. One more quick one for me, and then I'll kick it back over to Bianca. The caffeine aspect, that has been uh, a theme in Bevelg for the last 10 years. Like, it's only okay if it's naturally occurring. A, I would assume it's naturally occurring. And B, do you guys foresee any sort of headwinds from that from a regulatory standpoint? Well, you're right. It is naturally occurring. I mean, these are brewed with real tea and brewed with, with real coffee. So, so the caffeine that is 
in the product comes in with from those natural uh, sources. It's also light. The, the, the teas are in the low to mid 20s and milligrams per 12 ounce serving, which is which is very moderate. We're very and, and the coffees are a little shy of 30, whereas coffee brewed coffee can be all over the map. But it's typically quoted as being around 100 milligrams per cup. So we're talking less than a third. So one, be transparent about it. Two, this is an adult category anyway. It's coming in naturally and it's on the light side. As you full well, the hard tea category is generally a mildly caffeinated category and it's gigantic. So I don't foresee, I don't foresee, we're not doing anything further reaching, more aggressive. It's not, certainly not meant to be, have any association with energy or that kind of thing. It is with natural and it's on the light side and it's kind of in line with the category. So I don't foresee much discussion. Well said. And when does the non-alk spiked Duncan version come out? I'm totally kidding. Bianca, <laughs> back to you. <laughs> yeah, like the wait, like the the non-alcoholic hard cider. Yes. <laughs> you guys, I think, wrote about we finally jumped the industry's jumped the shark. It was spot on. It's like I did it, you did a double take, a hard wait a second. A non and, and non-alcoholic cider. hard seltzer as well, which is yeah. just yeah. extraordinary. <laughs> I told just you. Like- I told Jen we need to jump on the non-THC beverage business before everyone gets into it. I think we could probably transition to talking more about Mass Bay, unless there's anything else you wanted to add on Duncan. I think just the one thing that that I want to make sure, one of the reasons that that I changed over and, and joined the team here, I mean, a couple of things, obviously rich, amazing stories to tell with the core brands, which is for me just like amazing But of course, the growth mindset and the move toward remarkable innovation through partnership. And Duncan is such a great example of that. And I I feel a little bit not guilty, a little bit of like joining the party at the moment that this Duncan opportunity is blowing up. And in my very first week working with the team, it was when the, the news had kind of leaked and everything was happening. And there was such a great consumer outpouring. So You know, one of the things having done innovation for such a long time for Anheuser-Busch and and having launched hundreds of products is when people are pulling for it, it's just such an awesome thing. And with Duncan, we saw that. So there was really at this point, there's lots of amazing things in store, but out of the gate, it was really leaning in with partnership with Duncan into an owned and an earned strategy. So leaning into social media to get the news out there, leaning into PR, and obviously it just ignited something that was incredible. And so there were over 7 billion with a B media impressions to Today Show segments highlighting the partnership. When Duncan posted and, and really were utilizing our partnership with Duncan to reach their 2.3 million followers on their channels with this. But when they posted, I don't know if you guys saw the 7 a.m., 7 p.m. post, which gets to that, there, there was a post that they did to kind of launch the tease that was an awesome, super creative asset. And that was, they had over 70,000 shares, which was their highest shared asset of all time by Mm -hmm. 2X, right? And so that was over a million impressions. It was over a hundred thousand likes. There were 1500 comments. So you've hit a nerve of kind of the cultural zeitgeist that's a little bit different than kind of creating innovation in a boardroom or from scratch or things like that. Just the power of I think what has been ignited is ours to continue to steward into the future together with Duncan, but we could not be more excited about the amazing foundation that we have to build from on this one. Only other thing I would add is we are happy and active fielding calls as we are mapping out where we're going and where, given the, the your audience, I think there may be some interest. Feel free to reach out through the various channels about, about helping to influence where we go and when and with what priority between retailers and wholesalers, where we're going, when, and how are we going to show up? We love partnerships and we're looking for more, right? So that's, a, that's, mm-hmm. that's the only other thing I would say as we, it's, as it hits New England and the Eastern Seaboard, but this has runway further west than we normally travel. Yeah, I, real quick on that. How do you think about new markets? Do you look at, does Duncan's influence in any market kind of lead you where to go? Or how are you thinking about uh, the expansion? Well, I mean, it's a good transition to, uh, if we're going to talk about kind of Mass Bay broadly and innovation. I mean, ultimately, this will be a platform, and it and the ambition is for it to be a national one. But the question is timing and 
and Duncan is the tip of the spear. So for sure, where it's where the interest in Duncan is heaviest is going to be a major factor. Well, where are the most Boston transplants located? And that's, yeah. that's I know what you're all thinking though. <laughs> you said it's a we're an employee-owned company, and I think we've been at this longer than almost everybody. And you've seen a lot of companies just go away or sell out or whatever it is. We take real pride in our longevity and our ability to fight through challenges. And I think one of the one of the strengths that underpins our approach to business is how we treat people. And that's kind of consistent with being employee owned, but it's how we treat our vendors, our wholesaler partners. And we have people coming to us, which is wonderful. I mean, the acquisitions that we've done over the years, way back when with Catamount, Clown Shoes uh, six years ago, Long Trail, but people came to us and said, we love the way you run your business. We want to find a good home for our brands and our employees and stewards of both. And we, this, you're our preferred acquirer, which is a you know flattering thing to to hear. And I think we've done a decent job of that. We've kind of built up a little bit of a DNA, the ability to bring brands and people in house and acclimate them to our culture. So relationships, the Duncan relationship we had with Whistlepig, what we have with Polar, it's how we're going to build our business. So as Nathaniel talks about the tip of the spear. I'm incredibly excited, having been in this business since what's called microbrewing 37 years ago, to kind of bring two people of the caliber of Nathaniel and Val to join our amazing team and to just kind of see what the next chapter in the journey is. It's a, it's a, I love this business. I love the people in the business. Relationships still matter in beer. And that's a, it's a great way to earn a living as a result of that with the product that we love. So we're excited about the next chapter, and Duncan's a, obviously a key part of it. As Nathaniel said, there's more to come. Anything you want to share on what's next? I mean, how many more <laughs> things can fit on your plate? <laughs> I don't think so. We can just talk about Flannel Friday and Oktoberfest right now. And they, <laughs> or Harpoon IPA's 30th anniversary this year, which is something yeah. we're incredibly proud of. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that then. Yeah, it's when it, again, having been at it as so long, people talk about IPAs. What was it like? The younger people have a hard time really imagining a world without IPAs, which is phenomenal. It's a dream come true for somebody like me. But you'd be amazed at the amount of education that went into creating these different categories, creating craft beer, if you will. And Jim Cook and Ken Gross, but everyone would say the same thing. For our first five or 10 years, it was really just explaining to people, what are you doing? What is this? What is an IPA? Was that like the ALT beer that you sell or whatever else? So we're so proud of it. And I, what I love about Harpoon IPA is just how it showcases the four classic ingredients in beer so beautifully. And it's balanced. You can taste the malt and the hops and the yeast. It's It kind of hits a lot of those spots. And I think it's proven that in its longevity that it's a go-to beer. It remains a go-to beer for now a second generation of New Englanders. And we're incredibly proud of that. And even in the age of New England IPAs, right, and hazy IPAs, is it still one of your top brands or where it does is, it fit? It, okay. it is our top brand. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. But okay. it's our flagship by a factor of two or three. So okay. it remains incredibly important to us. And yeah, it's a, yes, a lot of other styles come. And I love a big juicy New England IPA, plenty in my fridge right now. So it's not like I'm uh, just hearkening back to Harpoon IPA, but it fits as a beautiful representation of a balanced hop forward classic IPA. So it was our it was our, our our American interpretation of the British style. That's what it was back in 1993 when it was first introduced as, as a harpoon summer seasonal. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very cool. Just you, you just went through a lot of things there, Dan. You guys have a lot on your plate. Got some great new people. I want to dig in that into that too. But two questions for you. First of all, do you and Jim Cook get along? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. We we used to try to get together at least once a year for beers, either at oh, his nice. place or our place. We're only about two blocks away yeah. now, as it turns out, because their headquarters is in the seaport. So they their headquarters kind of looks down on our, our brewery. And so yes, we we do get we do get along and have for many years many now. Years. Yeah. No, I figured you were going to say that. Otherwise, I wouldn't have asked the question. And <laughs> second, just real quick, and then I know there's a lot of questions here. Briefly, I want to dig in on the long trail deal because that's about a year old now. And it's super interesting for a lot of reasons, not only because people are coming to you saying you're our preferred acquirer, but also because they're also legendary in their own right. And you also kind of went in on it with Whistlepig, the famed whiskey maker. So what can you share about all of that like a year later? 
It's really worked out well. I had known Dan Fulham, the owner of Long Trail, for many years, 30, 35 years, actually, before he got into the, the business. But he bought it from Andy Fearson. We've been admirers of Long Trail for a very long time. I think Long Trail Ale occupies a similar place in Vermont to Harpoon IPA in southern New England as this iconic craft beer, one of the first, if not the first, in those respective markets. And the way they ran their business, their brewery location, if you've been to Vermont, it's in Bridgewater Corners, right near Killington, 19 acres right on the Ottaquiche River, which did flood pretty badly this year, but we're back up and running in 48 hours. Iconic location, iconic beer. Also picked up the Shed brand which, from Stowe, which is another great, more, more local Vermont uh, brand. So we like the brand asset. We love their retail location, the potential to really continue to grow that business. And we felt like we could be great stewards of the brand. So worked with our strategy. We have a tr strong presence already in Northern New England with Harpoon and UFO. And this just kind of further cemented our position, if you will, throughout New England as a leading craft brewer in the region. And Whistlepig, like, how do they come in? Whistlepig, all right, great. You know what? Again, relationships, Jen. Great friend, Jeff Kozak, the CEO. We've gotten to know those people really well. We did a, we've done a bunch of barrel-aged beer collaborations using their barrels. They've got a farm up in Shoreham, Vermont, not far from our brewery up there. We did a RTD we tried to do with them for a while, and so had fun. Again, it didn't work out, but we left relationships stronger than even when we started. So when we were looking to buy Long Trail. They had a brewery in Middlebury, Vermont as well. And we didn't need both Middlebury and Bridgewater and our banks weren't that excited about us picking up that additional real estate anyway. So I called Jeff and said, this is about you know 15 miles from your farm. You've told me how you could use additional space. What do you think about this buying this brewery? So we brought them in to the transaction. They ended up purchasing the facility in Middlebury. We still actually have a brew house there and a bunch of equipment, and we have a great relationship with uh, Jeff. We're doing a barrel-aged, a long trail uh, whiskey county stout, I think, a maple whiskey barrel-aged beer that's going to come out in the fourth quarter using whistle pig barrels. So we still maintain a great relationship with them. All right, back to you. Well, Valerie, we want to make sure we chat with you a bit about your new role before we get off the call. So what are your first line goals as CMO? And and additionally, what's the hardest thing about marketing and beer today? I think my primary goals are two things. One is growth and the other one is executional excellence. And both of those are growing on a really strong foundation the team has already set. And so growth is really about, we've been talking a lot about Harpoon and the core brands, Long Trail. Uh, we haven't mentioned it as much, but Clown Shoes, right? So it's really about focusing on those brands, growing on the consumer connections that are already there, but really just sharpening, pulling out the stories that really connect and break through in the category, and then making sure that we bring those to consumers in a 360 way. So taking it from ideation to campaign, across all of the consumer touch points, and most importantly, through our retail and our wholesale partners. And so making sure that we're bringing that to life all the way to the point of sale and, and in ways that drive those businesses forward and step change the way that we connect and the number of consumers we're connecting with. And so that's a big one is, is growing the core. And then obviously growing the new fun innovation and renovation um, experiments that we will be committing to and laying down. So obviously Duncan is an amazing first step for me out of the gate, a, a step <laughs> in a very long journey for so many of the folks who have been with the company for so long, but really making sure that we grow the Duncan Spike business to its full potential in partnership with the Duncan team um, and, and all the wholesale partners that are already a part of our system and those that are yet to join and the retailer partners that are part of our system and are yet to join. And then executional excellence is really about just backing up and making sure we've got the right pace of strategy, planning, and, and plans that make an impact. And so really just doubling down on growth and doubling down on executional excellence are, are my main focus. And then what's hard about beer? I mean, right, it's, anyone should be so bothered to be half to marketing and beer. It's such a tough job, right? <laughs> uh, I have all almost boy cousins are like, are you kidding me? You like freaking, you like drink beer for a job. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, I drink it, I market it. It's really tough. But yeah, I think the hardest thing, honestly, about marketing in beer today, there's a lot of fringe things. But if you boil it down to one thing and put a point on it, it's about trying to be remarkable. 
And so being remarkable, especially for legacy brands like Harpoon, like Long Trail, et cetera, it's about finding stories that emotionally and socially connect with people and then bringing them to life and connecting with them consumers with the right message and the right channels at the right time in ways that they are so remarkable that people literally remark on and share them and, and make you a part of their conversations and therefore the cultural conversation. And so I think that's a big thing, especially for the legacy brands and something we're committed to teasing out and really leaning into for the core part of our portfolio. And then the second piece of being remarkable is finding products that break through. So things like, it's, it's kind of like the once, twice, three times that I've been lucky enough to have it more than that in my lifetime where the Lime Maritas, the Duncan Spikes, they don't come along every day, right? And so these things that I've had the, the opportunity to create, to connect with wholesalers and retailers and consumers, but products that break through are tough. And it's about doing things differently. It's about making amazing product, liquid beer, whatever form that takes, and about bringing it to life in a way that consumers get incredibly excited about. And, and likewise, I'll never forget when I, we were doing a Lime Marita launch party at Anheuser-Busch and we were in Vegas, tough job again. And we were walking around, it hadn't launched yet. And there were two things that were good indicators there. Number one, people were selling the test beer cans, which was called test beer L at the time on eBay, right? And then number two, the first time you see a can on the street, right? You're like, ooh, people are drinking it, <laughs> right? So a can on the shelf, a can on the street. I think that's the thing with Duncan. I mean, before the actual official press release went out from the team, people started to put two and two together and Twitter slash X blew up, right? Some of the memes you wouldn't do as a marketer, but- the excitement that was there was incredible and cool and showed that it is a product that breaks through. And so I think, but that's hard to create, right? And one of the reasons I'm so excited to grow this team and join this team and grow this team is that I did the definition of kind of created in a boardroom slash with consumer groups and a lot of research, et cetera, for the majority of my career, but things that have authentic stories that connect and products and brands that break through is why I'm just excited at this point in my journey to be joining the team and be stewarding the amazing portfolio we have and the amazing portfolio to come into the world. Um, I wanted to just, I know we're coming up on time, but uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about two other relatively new launches. And one is the, the new logger line, American Flyer, that launched at an interesting time this spring. So what are you seeing with that brand so far. And then I also just wanted to ask about Recweed and how the dive into THC beverages is coming along. Well, I can tell you that ne neither of them met our hopes. Maybe the Recweed has met our expectations. The um, American Flyer, again, it's still relatively early days. It's kind of went into a very crowded end of the marketplace. Our team and certain whole wholesale partners got behind it big time, but others have been distracted by other challenges. And so right. I'd say it's had middling success as of right now. Recweed, we're doing that with a partner, Jordan, with this novel beverages in Maine and Massachusetts. And we had a lot of trouble in mass with the regulators, not us so much as novel about the what the brand, the name and the branding. Like there couldn't be anything on there about Harpoon in Massachusetts, whereas Maine allowed it to happen. So, but in both states, sales have been really weak. And what they have said to me, because this is over the last couple of weeks, is that it's really the sweet beverages that have done well in Maine and Massachusetts in the dispensaries, more the lemonades and the teas and other spiked beverages on the sweeter end of the spectrum, that the the beer, the more beer flavored beverages or, or even straight seltzers have really struggled. So that's what we've seen. Again, it's early days. It's such a fragmented, interesting business. And if you've been into dispensaries, they're not set up to sell beverages very well. So we they've been frustrated. We've been frustrated. The market just kind of continues to develop at its own pace. So, But I'd say the, the initial numbers are not encouraging. And for Recweed, it's not, that we're, it's not that we're giving up on it yet or that our partner is giving up on it yet, but the numbers are just really very small. Yeah. No, it, 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 go ahead. I was going to say my point of view is that it's less about 
how that particular product sold then the bravery to do it in the first place and the learnings that come out of it. And then you, you take that on board, discuss it and, and see what happens next. Totally. We, we certainly do remain interested in that market and, and also believe that people have been socializing with beverages for thousands of years and that yes, you pop a gummy, whatever, but that at some point this will become something significant. It just hasn't, it's not, everyone knows this. And even in Canada, I believe it's not kind of developing the way as quickly as people thought it might. How much of that do you think has to do with the very robust black market? People already have their channels. I mean, of course they're not going to do THC beverages in the black market <laughs> per se, Probably. but. I certainly think that there's, and we've been talking about this internally, that's a marketplace that is not immature in the sense that people have been using THC for decades and decades, right? And they have their preferred way of doing so, whether it's smoking or gummies or edibles, whatever it is. So they're not, I come at this from decades of beer drinking, thinking, gosh, this makes sense. This is how I like to do that. Well, people who are regular users they're probably less dissatisfied than we thought. They're quite satisfied with the options that they have for getting high. So the beverage piece is TBD, in my opinion. But I've been surprised that it hasn't kind of taken off more quickly. But again, that's my beer slant. I mean, you also in, be in beer, how it's merchandised at the retailer level is super important, right? And that's in its infancy in, in, in this market, right? And so it, it really matters. Is it cold? Is it available? Do you know about it? Did you run into it? to discover it. All that stuff seems yet to develop because it's very complicated, super fragmented, and very early. Very, and very you also early. don't have that sense. I talk to people about when people know that what they're getting in THC is the equivalent I'm going to make of a 12 ounce Budweiser mm -hmm. and the predictability of, I know the effect when I have one, two, three, or six over how many hours. And that THC world is all over the map. And I, so I, that, the lack of predictability in my mind is still holding things back as well. Right, right, right. Are you guys watching what's happening in Minnesota really closely because some of those THC beverages can go at normal retail? That will be really interesting to see and distributors getting in on it too. It's very interesting, right? I mean, <laughs> there will be these little microcosms that will be bellwethers for what, for what a national program might look like if things changed, right? But I think you have an obligation in this business to watch and learn. And I'm I'm very curious how it develops. One more for me, Nathaniel, I'm curious about your background. Valerie, I think you, did you come directly from AB? I did not. I've okay. actually been working at a company called Un Femme Wine, which is an amazing, all female winemakers, all sparkling, all of the wines give back to female centered charities. So again, kind of taking, I was employee number three there. So really helping grow that brand in, into a bit of a national powerhouse alongside the RNDC system, um, which is a whole nother story. You guys should totally <laughs> make sure the industry is covering. It's, yes. it's on an amazing growth streak. But most of my time, yes, at Anheuser-Busch and working with this um, gentle Canadian giant for the better part of 15 years uh, as my first innovation brewmaster at Anheuser-Busch. So yeah, I, I had a couple different stops throughout the industry, but the majority of my time at Anheuser-Busch and a lot of it working with the gentleman you're about to talk to. Hey, you, Nathaniel, sorry. Again, you're <laughs> the I, I mean, I, I'm anchored in brewing. I'm a brewer, brewmaster by by training and trade. And I've sort of my whole career has been at the interface between technology, whether that's writing recipes or getting them made and and commercializing them. So I've always been most energized by the complexities of bringing something to life, whether it's on the commercial side, but always anchored really honestly in in the and and practically in how stuff gets made. So so those are both constraints, but also I think of them as opportunities. And so so as I at AB, I was variously kind of the innovation brewmaster brewer. I worked in marketing for a stretch. I ran the pilot brewery for a few years. Long story short, I ended up as the global head of what they called innovation and development, which is basically R&D for consumer facing innovations. But at a global level, you are inventing things and capabilities that can then go get executed in a branded way in one of 
when I started six and then eventually sort of nine geographically based business units. It's a big place. And so I spent a lot of time on the plane and, and, and dropping in. But it was always like, how do you make something and what do you need to know to do something uh, really fun and exciting? One of the things that we were working on led to being invited to, to lead a joint venture with Keurig Dr. Pepper, which brought me to Boston. That we took a good run was cocktails in pods. Think of it as cocktails by Keurig. I think Jordan, we met during that phase. I think I demoed it if I recall. And a great run, fun ride, amazing people. And it ultimately didn't didn't work out. And we had to had to close it down. And I decided to stay in Boston. I had met Dan through some mutual acquaintances and sitting on a board during some time off. And he said, Hey, we need somebody that's got capabilities outside of of our own and I, that's what i love to do is is focus on focus on growth focus on the capabilities to unlock it so so that's really what got me excited and then once i met the team and had a few beers with dan and then his team it's an amazing group it's an amazing place it's just a great place to to spend your time and the ambition to grow and the willingness to learn is the combo that i was looking for right so so happy to that I can contribute things that are a little further outside beer because I picked up some tricks along the way and and then apply it here on a very relationship-based business in a place that I like to, to hang out with people that I want to do it with. It's perfect. Very cool. It sounds like you guys are about to 10X those partnerships and innovations. So we'll just give you our cell numbers and you can text us any hour of the night or day. Um, Beer God's very willing. Cool. Beer God's willing. Yeah. Readingly diplomatic answer. Well, J or B, do you guys have anything else? No, thank you all so much. It's great to uh, catch up with some of you again and really appreciate the time. Super fun. Very thank, welcome. You. thank you so much. Thank you for covering our industry so well. Thank you. We appreciate Thanks. that. Yeah, we try. That's all we, we do can do, best. right? Guys? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> awesome. That's thank a, you all. Yeah. yeah. Have yeah. a good That's Labor good. Day. You too. You too. Drink lots of beer. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers.